This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where my guest is multimedia artist Hannah Varga. Hannah incorporates the natural world into her work, and her current projects involve foraging for fibres she turns into both useful and beautiful items. The conversation began with Hannah talking about her work, past and present, and developed into a really important conversation about the value of items at their more than fiscal level. So I was born in Hungary, in Central Europe, and I am the first generation of um, my native homeland, having been born and spent my whole childhood post-communism so communism ended the year before I was born. And so I grew up in a brand new world, having heard a lot about another world that has just ended politically, an era that no longer exists. So I begin here because I think it's an important um, distinction to make that um, where I'm living now here in the UK, there has never been communism. And um that allowed me to have a completely different worldview and appreciation for all that is here and all that was not there in my childhood. So I lived the first 16 years of my life in Hungary. And then while I was still an art student, I was studying fine art, sculpture. I moved uh, to London and uh, for several years, I lived a double life working part-time in London and traveling all over Europe to visit uh, various museums and art galleries and to finish um, my art college in Hungary. And once I graduated, then um, I came back to the UK and I settled here full time and I've been living here for the past 16 years. So I'm based in the UK and uh, I began my professional life as a sculptor. I trained um, in the traditional school of fine art, working with bronze, and in fact, for my degree, I had to produce my first bronze sculpture uh, using the last wax bronze casting technique that is a, a very ancient process that has been around for thousands of years. So I come from that background of traditional fine art sculpture. I studied also art history. And then um, in London, I was working for several years alongside a small art bronze foundry in Fulham called the Crucible Foundry. And here I began working with, um, with leaves and I took a foundation course in botany and several other courses in order to learn more about leaves and plants. And that's where my work with, with the natural world, with the world of plants, that's where it began. And so... I co-founded a small art practice in London together with Sam Dalton, who's one of the founders of the Crucible Foundry, called Ashleaf. And this small art practice was dedicated to cast leaves in solid bronze, creating beautiful, unique leaf sculptures. You may have seen some of these on my Instagram if you've been following me for a while. So that's what I was doing for a number of years. And then four years ago, I decided to move away from London and um, I relocated to East Anglia with my son. He goes to school there. And that's when there was a shift for me, not only to move away from an urban to a rural environment, but it also meant to move my studio away from the foundry. And um, this move coincided with a shift in me not wanting to continue working with heavy metal anymore, with, with bronze, and finding more interest in community engagement and in socially engaged projects rather than creating uh, finished collectible pieces of artworks. There is this moment of clarity when I articulated to myself that I believe right now the world needs more people to be in touch with their own creativity and to be in contact with the natural world around them, then the world needs another Mona Lisa. So the focus of my work shifted in that direction in order to hold spaces for others to be creative. I consider this to be one of the greatest privileges of my life that from a very young age, I had uninhibited access to resources around me 
and here I would say access to nature and the outdoors mainly, and but also art materials and books and wonderful mentors and tutors and professors and artists who continuously encouraged me and showed me that it is possible to live a life filled with creativity, that you can make anything, you can make anything with your hands, your skills and your imagination. And I consider this to be one of the greatest privileges of my life that um, I feel a responsibility to share with others. The moving to East Anglia from London was a time when I was considering all of this and these thoughts and ideas just began to crystallize and, and rise to the surface. So I was in search for a new medium to work with and I love walking. I spend several hours outside every day. I go on long walks and I also go on pilgrimages like on really, really long distance walks. And I wouldn't call my time spent outside to be a hike because I feel that word to me, a hike does not encompass everything that happens to me outside, how I engage with the world around me and how I notice the elements and and how I enter into this dialogue with um, with the modern human world around me. So. I go on long walks and this is what I was doing also four years ago. And that's when I began to really notice what grows around me and not only noticing leaves as I had done previously and focusing on them. That was a difficult shift to make, to move away from leaves and to to really open my awareness and to let other things in. So that took a while and slowly I began First, just noticing plants growing alongside the footpath I've been walking and alongside the fields and by the hedgerows. And then I began collecting them. I built a shed in my back garden where I started collecting the plants and identifying them and processing them. And I began talking to basket weavers and I started getting books and uh, going on courses and learning various basketry techniques. I was interested in not so much making baskets, however, teaching my hands how to create texture out of plant fibers. I also found that I could just go on a walk every day and I could gather my own art materials. That felt very liberating as opposed to what I used to do before, that I had to order all the materials that were needed for bronze casting. In fact, I needed a whole team of people. I couldn't just do it myself. A foundry requires a few people in order to make bronze casting happen because it's a big operation. It requires kilns. It's a tremendous amount of energy and human and material resource that needs to be moved. Whereas I felt going outside, walking and foraging the raw ingredients for my work was something very aligned with the pace of the life I wanted to to invite more into my everydays. Yes, so through trial and error and having loads of fibers lost due to mold in autumn and spring in a shed, as you are probably very well aware, how damp a shed can be in the weather seasons. Definitely. So yes, I lost loads of fibers uh, in several seasons. And it also allowed me to keep gathering and doing a material research from all the plants that are growing around me, not only in my street and the fields around me, but as far as I could reach on foot. I managed to map the area through the season, through the plants, and really become very intimate with when is the ideal time of picking for certain plants. Similarly, if you think about apples or cherries, there is an ideal time for harvest, and that's the same with plant fibers for cordage making and rope making. And so through doing this research, I think in about two years, I got to a place where I had enough knowledge and experience of the fibers that I could forage from the landscape around me in East Anglia, that I could make something out of them. And I knew that I was not very captivated by the idea of making vessels and making baskets. However, 
when I started working with cordage and then through cordage with rope and then through making rope, I got to knotting and knots. I was entirely in love with this whole process and with all the symbols and metaphors in language and in my thoughts, the entire language that was describing connections and entanglements and binding and tying and strings and knots, I was completely captivated because I'm working with forage materials. I can gather my own art materials from the landscape around me. So therefore, this is also zero carbon footprint that it doesn't travel. It's not traveling from China. I'm collecting it on foot myself. That is another sustainability element. So in the past two, three years, I've been mainly focusing on cordage making, strings and knots and rope making. And as far as I can tell, this is what I will continue. I see this as an endless, lifelong fascination for me, that there is no end to learning more about the plants and about developing my skills with them in this direction. So that's in a nutshell how I got to where I am now. <laughs> I mean, so many questions, but I think something you said towards the end there, you're kind of capturing, I suppose, the essence of a place because you are harvesting stuff from a location. So it's place specific. Does the kind of culture of the place also factor into what you produce? By now, yes. Initially, I wasn't so aware of the culture of the place. However, what I was working on in East Anglia is very different to the projects I'm working on now, uh, developing here where I am in the Scottish Highlands and also in the Peak District where I'm relocating to. So, yes. The more time I'm spending in a place and the more my awareness uh, broadens, the more I can include of not only of the local landscape and the plants, but also uh, of the local culture. For example, now here in, I'm in the tip of the Black Isle, an hour north of Inverness in the Scottish Highlands, and the landscape here and the culture and the history has been shaped by its coastal history and the maritime activity in the harbour. There used to be hemp rope works that um, were providing ropes for, for ships, for, the, for a naval base. And even earlier than that, this was a fishing harbour and a fishing port where presumably there were loads of fishermen making nets and, and making cordage and ropes to fish. So that history is is very much in my awareness at the moment. And I'm currently reading and researching and talking to local people and local historians about what remains of, of all this history that is largely lost to us these days. And what kind of plants can you use in your work? All kinds of plants. I would say that any plant fibre is suitable for making string there is one important factor it only depends on how much time patience and skills someone has so a great discovery for me was in recent years is that i can make rope out of leaf stems they are quite short and fragile however if i process them the right way with the right imagination and uh, having sufficient skills, I can transform them into a piece of strong rope. You actually mentioned a word that I'd made a note of whilst you were talking, and that was patience. There's so many different aspects to what you're doing. And the reason I think this is because I went to see The Nettle Dress a couple of weeks back. Such a great film. Yeah, yes. it was beautiful. But what struck me is that whole thing of a slow, very decreased output there's so much effort that goes into something that is very time and place specific but it's also like a snapshot of that person's life because so much of them goes into it and yet the output is much reduced to if you were doing something on a mechanical scale and I think that as a human race at the moment we may find that quite jarring how do you justify spending the time and also like that economical output as well? Because then we can charge for our time and we can have lots of things to sell. How does that work for you? It's a valid question and a valid consideration. 
I think I would like to begin answering this coming from a rather anti-capitalist perspective where I do not focus on productivity as such or how I can make the most out of something. In fact, that language itself to me is very capitalist and is based on exploitation, exploiting time and exploiting human resource and exploiting natural resource. And I would like to approach responding to your question from a place where the quality of my life and the quality of my work is dependent on the attention I'm able to give to what I'm making. And I think when I consider that to be, I don't know, a kind of currency that cannot be necessarily measured with time or with money, but it offers a different quality. I don't know what kind of measure we can use here that is universally acceptable other than trusting that what I'm creating and working on, I believe, has value and will add to people's lives. And I believe this is the highest contribution I can give in this lifetime as a human being to others in this moment in time. Yeah, it's such an important point and such an important way of reframing our whole ideas about how we kind of spend time and what we do with our creativity and everything. You sent this to me in an email about your notes on the project that you're working on at the moment and you mentioned creating reciprocity with the more than human world. Does that tie into that? Yes, yes, it does. And in terms of the return from the work and the conversation, when I moved away from London and I stopped creating so-called products that are sellable and I started focusing more on community work and socially engaged projects, I realized that the outcome is not where I get paid, that the payment for my work, the financial compensation can come from many different sources. And this could include crowdfunding. It could include local charities. So I sometimes apply to for funding anywhere between £200 and £2,000. It could include larger funding, such as the Arts Council and bigger organizations that support the arts. And it can also come from private patrons who choose to donate money for me to work. So the pressure is not at the end result that only those can access my work who can pay for it and collect it and, and lock it away and, and just keep it to themselves. Of course, that still happens and there's nothing wrong with owning beautiful works of art and having it in our homes. However, I believe everyone has the right to have access to so-called arts and experience a different quality through that access. I believe it, it's a fundamental right of every human being to have access to artworks. And I would like to create opportunities where people can have, have access to the artworks I'm creating and projects I'm working on, regardless whether they are in a position to financially contribute to it or not. In fact, I think there is the reciprocity there, the, the paying it forward, that I'm almost inviting them to come and experience something and therefore learning how to care for it and then reinvest in it. So I think someone has to make the first step towards those who do not yet know how to appreciate creative work and what the worth or value of creative work is. And the same goes for the natural world and the climate crisis arguments where why are there so many people who don't care for the natural world and, and for the climate crisis? Because they may not know about it yet so intimately in order to care for it. And I think the same goes for art in this respect. You're kind of paving the way in lots of different ways. But as you were saying about storing materials in the shed, these are things that people would have known how to do in times gone by but what you're doing is kind of picking up the pardon the pun the threads and collecting that knowledge back and putting it back into use and putting your take on it and you know I think it's that whole idea of taking this knowledge that we've lost and then making it accessible so I think again that's just such an important part of the process and it's a really good thing for people to remember that. Thank you. That sounds like a wonderful reaffirming 
compliment to my work. So I appreciate that. I don't know what people are going to, to do with what I'm presenting them with. I think there is that exciting possibility that never ceases to amaze me that each and every person who sits down and learns to make a piece of cordage with me will bring stories with them and it will reach something in them that is unique dependent on where they come from their set of experiences and impressions they received in their lives and how it connects to them is completely unknown to me i have no way of knowing who is going to walk in and what they are bringing with them and how what i'm offering them will connect to that which is wonderful and i think uh, the evocative nature of cordage making and ropes and knots is again something i find just like you said leading people back to the past and at the same time i think it can also lead people forward into the future so one thing to highlight is that plastic strings and ropes and twines they are currently the number one pollutant of marine wildlife and this is not just because they strangle the necks of larger animals it's also the microplastic the plastic strings and ropes are breaking down that uh, gets into our water system and damages the tiny animals in in the water in the sea and in the streams and and it, we also eat these animals and it also gets into our water so in a way i have a, a secret mission if i can call it as that that i would love to teach everyone i meet how to make a piece of string from the weeds that are growing around them walking distance from their home or in their back garden or by the block where they live if it's a block of flats in an urban environment because if they would be able to make just the string they need in their kitchen or wrapping presents or christmas is coming just what they would need in their own household then no one would need to buy any more plastic string and rope thank you very much to hannah and thank you to you for listening as well i hope you found this interview as thought provoking and perspective shifting as i did now here's Dr. Ian Bedford with his bug of the week. Brassicas are a genus of plants within the mustard family that our cruciferous vegetables and cold crops belong to. And over time, their extensive cultivation has resulted in a number of insect species becoming brassica specific pests, seemingly unaffected by glucosinolates, which are the brassica plant's natural defense chemicals. One of the most common of these pests is the cabbage whitefly, Aliorhodes proletella, which can be found throughout Britain at almost any time of the year. Cabbage whitefly are just over a millimetre in length, and although they resemble tiny little white moths, they're actually sap-sucking hemipteran bugs, and in the same taxonomic order as aphids. Adult whitefly congregate together on the underside of young leaves, where the males and females will pair and mate. Their eggs are then usually laid in circles, each attached to the leaf surface by a basal spike. Then after a few days they split open to reveal a tiny nymph that crawls off to find a leaf vein where it inserts its needle-like mouthparts and begins sucking out plant sap. It then sheds its skin, then remains stuck to the leaf for the rest of its juvenile life, connected into the leaf's vascular system plant sap continually flows into the nymph over the following weeks, with the excess being excreted as sticky honeydew. But to avoid drowning in its own honeydew, the nymph stores it within an orifice at the end of its body, before flicking it away with a spoon-like appendage called a ligula. But as the honeydew rains down, it invariably lands on the lower leaves, forming a sugary layer that allows black sooty moulds to establish and grow. Eventually, after three to four weeks, the nymph stops feeding. Its skin hardens, and an adult whitefly begins forming within, which a week or so later hatches out and flies off to the younger leaves, where it congregates with others, just like the previous generation of adults had done, to mate and lay eggs. Effectively controlling cabbage whitefly, would likely be tricky, since they'll be difficult to access amongst the plants, 
and also the airborne adults will be continuously reinfesting. But since the nymphs will only be on the lower surfaces of older leaves, it may not be necessary to control them, unless the infestation is very severe and the edible parts of the plants are becoming contaminated with black sooty mould. In which case, a proprietary soap-based product, or even a chemical one, might have to be used, provided it's approved for use on edible plants, with clear instructions on application and harvest intervals. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.